What's this? A letter for me. Welcome to another episode of Remember the Great Sports. Um, today is another Through the Mail Thursday video. I am going to share with you some recent uh, returns. I think most likely that some of them are baseball. Uh, there is one postmark from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, that, of course, doesn't mean anything, but I'm doing a little catch-up right now, and I think this may be my one and only spring training request. Um, I've mentioned to a lot of viewers, uh, whether it's been in comments or through email or whatever, that I typically don't write people through spring training. Um, I focus, as most of you know, most of my collection on retired players. I don't autograph too many current players through the mail uh, for various reasons. Um, I autograph in person sometimes, so I try to get current players in person, not through the mail. Uh, so I focus mainly on retired players. So. I think that's one of the returns, but we're going to jump right in here and open up three of these and see what we got. Okay, the first one is postmarked from the Kansas City area, and it is former Chicago White Sox great Ken Berry on his rookie card. On one, 69 tops makes two. Another 69 tops. Four. And last but not least, five. So five total Ken Berry autographs. So Ken Berry, not to be confused with the actor, Ken Berry, was a uh, Chicago White Sox for nine seasons. He played center field primarily. Uh, he actually did win a couple gold gloves, I believe. Yep, two-time gold glove glove winner in center field, uh, one-time all-star. Uh, he was not a really heavy-hitting outfielder. Uh, his top season, he hit eight home runs. Oh, I'm sorry. He hit 12 one season. So in his top season, in his 14-year playing career, he only hit double-digit home runs one time in center field. But he was, you know, a very, very, very proficient outfielder, defensively skilled-wise. Um, he was a fixture. If any of you are White Sox fans, you know who Ken Berry is. He was a fixture from 1965, basically, to 1970 with the Chicago White Sox. So if you followed the White Sox during that era, you definitely know who this guy is. Um, he spent a total of 13 years in the league, or 14 years in the league. His uh, first three seasons with the White Sox, it looks like he was uh, up and down in the minors, you know, with probably some September call-ups or whatever they call that. Um, and after he left the White Sox, after uh, nine years, he went to the California Angels as their full-time outfielder um, and spent some time doing that, you know, for the Angels. After he left the Angels, he played one season. Uh, in 98 games for the Milwaukee Brewers, and he finished his career up in 1975, appearing in 25 games for the Cleveland Indians. Overall, his uh, career numbers are 255. Uh, he has over a thousand hits with uh, 1053, and he only has 58 home runs. So again, you know, not a offensive powerhouse when it comes to uh, outfielders, but a very, very good defensive center fielder, which if you're building a defensive team, you know, somebody like Ken Berry is somebody that you would want on that team. So thank you, Mr. Berry. All right, this next one. Doesn't have a postmark. Sometimes you get lucky and you get envelopes like that. The uh, Postal Service must have missed it, but uh, it is from former Boston Red Sox, Dave Moorhead on one, two, three, and four. Also a uh, Kansas City Royal for quite some time. But if you notice on the Red Sox card, he inscribed his no-hitter date, 9-16-1965. Uh, in the letter that I wrote him, I asked him, you know, can you inscribe the uh, Red Sox card with your no-hitter? And he uh, gladly obliged. 
So very, very happy for Mr. Moorhead to do that. So we'll talk a little bit about his career. Um, Dave Moorhead, overall, as a starter, well, not as a starter, but overall in his career, he has a 40 wins and 64 loss record. Uh, as a matter of fact, in 1965, the year that he pitched his no-hitter, he actually tied for the league lead in losses. He was 10-18 and 18 that season. Uh, he is a victim of playing for some pretty bad teams, to, to say it nicely. The Boston Red Sox, when he was there, were average. Um, they, of course, went to the World Series. He was in the World Series team, so I wouldn't say they were average. That was actually his best ERA year, it looks like. He was actually out of baseball, you know, in the major league level by the time he was 28 years old. So, uh, came onto the scene as a 20-year-old rookie in 1963. Had a respectable season as a rookie, going with 10 wins and 13 losses. Uh, had an ERA of 3.81, so the sky was the limit. However, his uh, sophomore season, he only went 8-15. and 15. Then I guess you would call his junior season, he went 10-18. and 18. So... Those were basically the primary years that he was used as a starter. After the 1965 season, um, he was basically delegated to the bullpen as he, you know, only started a handful of games, you know, at that point in his career uh, until he went to the Kansas City Royals at the end of his career in 1970. So, uh, Dave Moorhead, uh, one of the very few uh, of that elite club, they can say that they threw a no-hitter in Major League Baseball. Um, did not have a good season, but he shined on that day. I was actually looking at the Wikipedia page, and uh, he pitched the no-hitter against the Cleveland Indians at Fenway Park, and it said there was like like 1,200 people, like just over 1,200 people in attendance to witness that game. So... If you were one of those 1,200 people <laughs> to see a no-hitter at Dave Moorhead's you know, game in Boston in 1965, that's pretty impressive. Because every time there's a significant uh, time in history, you know, like uh, Hank Aaron's home run or whatever, you know, somebody's like, well, I was at that game. <laughs> you know, well, there's only about 1,200 people other than the players, you know, that were on the teams that can actually say that they were actually at the game, you know, um, outside of the people that worked at the stadium and that kind of thing. So uh, Dave Moorhead, very, very cool to get him back. Uh, nice vintage era autographs there. All right, my sign's kind of getting out of whack a little bit. But we're going to wrap this up. And this is my one spring training return because of the thickness of the envelope. And uh, I didn't send a lot of cards because this gentleman is not one to sign a lot of cards. So I, I only stuck with two and sent them, uh, and it is indeed who I thought it was, and they are beautifully signed in nice, thin blue Sharpie, and that is former Milwaukee Brave, San Francisco Giant Great, Montreal Expos manager and player great, Philippe Alou, of the famous trio of the Alu brothers. And to let you guys know, Philippe is a special advisor or spring training instructor for the San Francisco Giants. So I sent this to the Arizona address uh, of the training facility for the San Francisco Giants. So if you're watching this video, uh, which spring training's over as I'm shooting this, you're probably not going to get another opportunity to write Mr. Alu until next spring training. So keep that in mind, you know, late January, um, early February of next year. If you want to try to get Philippe Alou's autograph, you know, simply send a letter to the spring training address of the San Francisco Giants. So we're going to talk a little bit about Mr. Alou's career. I mean, his career is astounding, to say the least. Um, he is, you know, one of the greatest to ever play the game. You know, probably not in the Hall of Fame. Um, probably is never going to get in the Hall of Fame, unfortunately. Um, although I feel that with the 
talent level that they're kind of letting in the Hall of Fame. I, I'm not going to go on a tangent like many people have in the media and even on YouTube about how I feel the bar has been lowered, okay? But that's my honest opinion. I feel the bar has been lowered. And there's a lot of people that are now getting in the Hall of Fame and we're overlooking stars from this era like Philippe Alou, Al Oliver, you know, Bill Madlock, Dave Parker, you know, just, just to name a few, Dale Murphy, et cetera, et cetera, that it's like, well, if there's guys that are going in with less numbers than those guys, why aren't they in the Hall of Fame? So maybe they'll get the call. That's that's what I hope. But I feel that because of the contribution to the game that Mr. Alou has given, you know, maybe his numbers on the field don't match up to the superstars of the game. But between his managering, you know, his uh, manager career and his playing career, Senator like Joe Torrey, for example, you know, I feel that somebody with the combination of all those years in baseball, why, why not put him in the Hall of Fame? I mean, Joe Torrey's in. Joe Torrey was a great player, but he was also a great manager. So was this guy. So that's my little rant on Philippe Alou. Um, he spent 17 years in the majors. He has 21-01 on his career hits. Uh, had about three seasons um, that he had over 200 hits. Check that, make that two seasons. He's a three-time All-Star. Played for the San Francisco Giants. The Milwaukee Braves, of course, the Atlanta Braves after that. Uh, played for the Oakland A's for a couple seasons. The New York Yankees, I was unaware of that. The Montreal Expos has shown, which he later became the manager. And also the Milwaukee Brewers for three games. His final season when he was 39 years old. Uh, primarily used as an outfielder uh, most of his career. He played the most games in right field, although he played all three outfield positions, which it goes back to show his superior, superior ability to not just hit, but also to play the field. He was that flexible that he could play any of the outfield positions and do it very well. Um, so, you know, his lifetime numbers, you know, his home run totals aren't huge. He's a lifetime 286 hitter. So he's not, you know, a 300 hitter for his career, but there are some Hall of Famers now that aren't anyway. So, you know, 206 home runs by far, not an impressive amount, you know, but his contributions to the game as just a manager and a, a player, I think should be taken into consideration. So... In addition to his playing career, uh, many of you, as I just touched on, he became the manager of the Montreal Expos. Uh, he held that position from 1992 to 2001. And after he was let go by the Astros, uh, he was out of baseball or doing something else in baseball, not managing. And then he became the manager of the San Francisco Giants up until 06. Uh, after 06, um, he became like I said, a special instructor, front office type person for the Giants and still works in that capacity still to this day at age 83 years old. So he's 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 uh, not a young man anymore, to say it nicely. Um, one of the things, looking at his uh, uh, Wikipedia page, and again it's Wikipedia, um, it's saying that he is one of the first Dominican players to be a regular to play in the majors. I'm not saying that he was the first Dominican to play in the majors. I'm just saying that he was one of the first star Dominicans to really shine and be an everyday player. Um, so, anyways, um, Mr. Alou, I think you're a Hall of Famer. Hopefully you'll get in there someday. Uh, when the baseball writers take a look at your career contributions to the game that you're still contributing to till this day, I mean, just because you're not on the field as a manager... If you're still a special instructor and you're still involved in the front office of a team, that should also, you know, be something that should be taken under consideration, especially since they've put, you know, general managers in the Hall of Fame now. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Alou. You know, thank you, Mr. Moorhead. I kind of mixed those. And Mr. Barry for signing all these. These are another great stack of vintage autographs to add to your collection. Definitely consider writing these guys. I look forward to your comments below. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks.